Live from SABC headquarters in Auckland Park, welcome to our third edition of The Watchdog in 2023. My name is Vuyam Vogo and here's what we have in store for you this evening. Justice delayed, justice denied. We look at some of the cases and instances that last year shaped public perceptions of our justice system and which are going to feature quite prominently in 2023. We also look at some of the events that involved um, many of our leading or some of our leading uh, personalities within the justice system. That's our focus this evening. The Watchdog starts now. Now, according to the man who was last year appointed the country's chief justice, South African courts are actually doing fairly well. Judge Raymond Zondo, in his Judiciary Performance Report released a year ago, said South African courts were actually meeting their targets. They finalized 9,749 of those cases. That translated to 85%. That was a great achievement. They exceeded their target. They had set for themselves the target of 64% finalized civil matters. They had a total of 83,080 civil cases and finalized 69,908 of those cases. That translated to 84%. That means that divisions of the High Court exceeded their target by 20% in this regard. That was a pleasing performance. They also set for themselves the target of reducing the percentage of criminal trial backlogs to 30%. They were not able to achieve this target, but they reduced the percentage of criminal trial backlogs to 41%. They were 11% short of their target. The Chief Justice also considering that, of course, there remain huge backlogs. A reduction of criminal backlogs in the divisions of the High Court. All the divisions of the High Court had set for themselves the target of reducing their backlogs of criminal trials to 30%. However, many of the divisions failed to achieve that target. Only about three divisions of the High Court managed to reduce the backlog of criminal trials. Reserved judgments. All superior courts had set for themselves the target of 70% finalized reserve judgments. They collectively exceeded this target by 8% and achieved 78 finalized reserve judgments. The superior courts had 4,526 reserve judgments and they delivered 3,511 
reserve judgment within, judgments within three months. Now, cases like that of murdered soccer star Senzo Meiwa continue to cast a big shadow of doubt on our justice system. Having dragged on for more than eight years and still nowhere near being completed with dramatic twists and turns, including allegations that the president himself was among those behind a plot to conceal the real killers of the soccer star, the Mayua trial has exposed the sordid underbelly of the South African justice system. Now, before I bring on my analysts and activist guests for this conversation, here's Criselda Lewis briefly taking us down memory lane as the case was about to get interesting. And suddenly, advocate Malisela Defu, representing accused number one to four, abandoned the case. Exactly. Even, even if it's one sentence, even if... But On the 12th of July, the court was due to hear advocate Malisela Tifo's application to challenge the High Court in Pretoria's jurisdiction to hear the Mayua trial. But he failed to file heads of argument for this challenge, prompting what had become the norm, an exchange between himself and presiding judge Chifua Maumela over procedure. Fill me in whether I, what is the position with those heads. No. Now you want me to listen to him on top of something that is outstanding. What kind of proceedings do you want us to run? I still reiterate that I think this is a protocol and the right protocol because the matter belongs to the parties, to the state and the accused, not to the court. The court has to listen what the parties have agreed upon. No. There is agreement. The court but has to direct these proceedings. You cannot, I cannot hear from the two of you. Uh, I have to direct my proceedings the way I know proceedings should run. And you cannot tell me how I should, proceed, uh, I should direct those proceedings. And I have told you, I need an explanation. I don't want a full explanation. I want to be told what is the position about the heads I expected, which I don't have on my table. As confirmed by advocate for himself when he was on the floor just a few minutes ago, the issue of jurisdiction has been abandoned. And my Lord will recall that would have been the main reason why we would reconvene today part of the reason why I would convene um, today. I submit and I request this honorable court not to entertain any application today. The purpose for today's court sitting was to deal with the issue of jurisdiction. Instead, Tifo brought a letter in which accused number three Mtobi Simnube alleged inhumane conditions at the prison where he is incarcerated. He has suffered enough. Shortly after, Tifo dropped a bombshell. The reason your lordship, I can no longer be able to be in court and face you. There are serious allegations here, whereby you are accused number one. Um, before I can even accept the case of 636 to represent the accused one to four, there has been harassment that I should not be part of this case. From the police, from the NPA. I came into this case knowing what will be the consequence. On the 28th of April, when I was arrested before your court, uh, Lordship, that was a plan. And the plan was hatched in the office of the president, the number one office of the number one in the country. That I'm a problematic advocate. I'm interfering with the plan that has been hatched that my client 
should take the responsibility of the murder of Senzo Meiwa. Despite the fact that they were innocent. Leaving the instructing attorney Titi Tobane at the helm for those accused, at least at that time. May I be excused, Well excused. The, 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 the uh, advocate Tepo, you derobe once you are out of the court. You don't derobe here before me. This certainly does throw this particular case in limbo. He says he believes uh, that uh, the judge in this particular matter has not treated him fairly. Well, we certainly saw the exchange of words between uh, Judge uh, uh, Chifo Maumela this morning and uh, Advocate Malisela Tifo. Recall that today what was scheduled to happen inside court was that uh, he was due to uh, argue uh, an application regarding jurisdiction of this particular matter and jurisdiction which Advocate Malisela Tifo felt that this particular court could not uh, uh, hear or try this particular matter because uh, the crime scene itself had taken place uh, at um, uh, in Fos Loris um, on the East Rand. Crisalda Lewis, SABC News in Johannesburg. Please welcome regulars on the show, legal analysts Mbumelelo Zigalala and Ntabiseng Tubazana from Zigalala attorneys and Tubazana attorneys respectively. We also have Joel Mshongo from the organization Right to Know, which among other things fights for accountability and responsiveness in the administration of justice. Good evening to all of you. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you for having us. I'll start with um, uh, you, Mbumelo. I mean, if, uh, if, if, if I may, I mean, we often hear, you know, uh, that um, whatever happens in court or courts get to inherit is, of course, a product, basically, of what would have gone into it all by way of investigations by the police, the work of the NPA, and, uh, and so on. And, and that's important to actually... Uh, bear in mind, isn't it? I'm sorry. Uh, I think I missed you a little bit. There, there was a little bit of a, of a skip or a freeze. I am so sorry. I missed your question. <laughs> for you. Well, I was saying uh, it's it's important, perhaps as a departure point, we should underscore uh, the the point uh, that uh, whatever the courts or whatever we see happening inside the court is at the end of the day a product of uh, the work that would have gone into the case um, by way of investigations and other things by the police, uh, the work of the NPA and so on. 100%. Um, unfortunately, the courts rely so much on the investigations that are going to happen once the matter has been brought before the NPA. So what usually would happen is that the NPA and the SAPS would be liaising throughout the investigations. At that stage, um, usually the accused persons are already appearing before the court. The matter gets postponed a few times or a number of times for further investigations where the NPA is you know, instructing the SAPS to please look into that, please look into this so they can build a, a stronger case against the accused persons. And if at that stage where the matter is now ready for trial, the state is of the opinion that there is sufficient evidence to proceed against the accused person, that is what they are stuck with. You can't now bring new evidence and then expect me as a legal defense attorney to say, oh, wait, well, you can accept this now because we only just got it. No, you were given sufficient time and you are the one who informed the court and said that I am ready to proceed. Mm -hmm. And now you seem to not be ready. So we cannot now, um, you know, fault the court in what is happening. It is now within the hands of the court to adjudicate based on the information that is put before it. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, as, as, as the theme of our conversation today, I mean, goes... Indeed, I mean, justice delayed is uh, justice denied. And uh, cases like uh, the one of uh, uh, Senzo Meiwa uh, really, I mean, given the fact that, I mean, it's been, this, this matter has been dragging on for more than eight years now, and it is nowhere near conclusion. And just at a time when everyone goes, Phew, finally, you know, this matter is in the courts and this trial should continue. We had the twists and the turns and the drama um, that Criselda Lewis uh, captured there um, in the piece. What for you over the past year did this particular case, what are the issues that this case uh, threw up for you? 
is the trend for... For me... Oh, uh, no, sorry, I'll take Mpumelela. Oh, okay. No, I, I think it's, it's generally the working of the legal justice system. I think it's very slow. The walls of justice are grinding very slow in these particular matters. Now, it takes eight years for investigations to take place. It takes it probably going to take another few years for investigations, even for, for them to start. And once they have started, you then see the NPA going to battle with sort of uh, two dockets, which for me should have been fused together so that you're able to extract all the evidence which is required, and you have one coherent witness list which you are going to uh, prepare and be able to prove your defense, your, 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 your attack with. And let's remember that the burden of proof when it comes to the NPA in criminal cases is that they must be able, be able to prove beyond reasonable doubt that the individuals who are in the accused box are indeed the one. Now, if you are going to find pieces of evidence which is flying here and there, witnesses which cannot be brought up to court or conflicting statements which are in the hands of your opponents, now, the chances of you being able to achieve that are going to be very limited. But another side when it comes to the workings of the court, as was correctly stated, justice delayed is justice denied. It's the role of the court and the presiding officer in this particular matter. In terms of saying, let me stick to the rules as they are. There's the Criminal Procedure Act, there's Section 342A, capital A, which is there, dealing specifically with unreasonable delays. I want to make sure that, that I'm able to preside over this matter as soon as possible. And if it means that I need to add a few innovative issues, or elements, then it means I must do so. Now, one for me which always stands out is that why do we start at 10 o'clock? Why don't we start at 9? Why do we have to end at 3 and why don't we end at 4? Because at the end of the day, those officials which are hired by correctional services are there to do a job. So if you are going to, we are going to require extended hours so that we get adequate court time. That's exactly what we need. And also the introduction of technology. Now, the exchanging of documents, the exchange of, of, of dockets, why do we have that in electronic format so that it's easier for us to say, look into the case lines, for example, to be able to find all the documents that are there. So those small innovative ways of making sure that we're able to deliver justice to the members of the public, which what is required in this case. And it falls upon the presiding officer who then becomes the judge, who then becomes the referee and the person who's going to decide the measure at the, at the, at the end of the day to say, I do not want any time wasted in my cost, in my court. I'm going to make sure that we are all here efficient and ready to deal with matters. Yes, there are going to be delays with certain applications which have to be made. You cannot deny accused persons for making those applications. However, deal with them efficiently and make sure that everybody is given a fair chance. And if you manage your time correctly, then you may be able to finish this case within record time. Mm -hmm. uh, from where you sit, uh, Joel Mshongo, I mean, has uh, the Mawiwa case, uh, which we're using as, as an example, uh, raised any accountability issues? Has it raised any uh, issues of responsiveness, which are uh, things that uh, appeal to you uh, or that you always focus on when it comes to the administration of justice? Thank you. Um, I think um, uh, based on, on, on that uh, case as a, as a case study, one could be able to deduce the fact that um, our justice system has problems. And one of the main issues is the fact that um, there is a deterioration in terms of police investigation capacity and weak case management. Also, the criminal justice system has been weakened and dismantled through the years of political interference in fighting as well as questionable appointments, among other things. And this has resulted in the exodus of experts, lack or inadequate capacity, and deterioration of professionalism. However, one important thing is the fact that many cases recently, as uh, one, of, uh, um, one of the panelists has indicated, depends on forensic evidence. However, as per the previous argument, there is no enough capacity to ensure that the turnaround time is fast enough to ensure that cases are not postponed unnecessarily. And as this case um, continues to, to show us, until all those um, issues or glitches that are actually um, making our justice system to be unable to grind fast enough, um, um, if they are not addressed, we will continue to have um, um, those challenges.
I, I just on, on, on the back of what Joel has just said, uh, Mbumele, I want to come back to a point you raised, because I think it's linked to some of the things that uh, he, he, he was saying. You were talking about the introduction um, uh, of, um, of uh, information um, technology. And I remember people like, um, you know, Judge uh, Dennis Davis raising such issues as, you know, I mean, where like basic things that uh, our court system doesn't have, you know, uh, dodgy phones, buildings that are not safe, uh, you know, broken windows, um, you know, like it, painting a, a really sorry picture, you know, of, uh, of, of, of our courts. And of course, that raising the issue of whether in fact they are able to cope with, um, um, uh, you know, uh, to be able to actually do what they're supposed to they're supposed to do. But you definitely, even such as small things as parking, there are some mm -hmm. boys where you're not going to find adequate parking, left alone when it comes to the inside of the court in terms of proper spaces in which one can be able to work. You can be able to find plugs which are working so that you're able to plug your devices and be able to work. But most importantly, it's the linkage between technology, the information of the devices that we have so that we're able to work, we we'll make our work much more efficient. Now, let me take Pazul Natala, for example, we don't have case lines. How then is better? Did we have case lines and it's working better? Now, the question would be, why did we introduce the same over to the province of Pazul Natal? I'm filing and delivering papers in the same way in which our counterparts or the previous uh, individuals did in 1994. We're still doing the same way. Now, if you have seen that something is working optimally in one province, why don't you want to go and do all those particular matters in the same province? Let's take motion court proceedings, for, the, for example, when it comes to civil matters, they could have easily be done in platforms that you are doing now to Zoom. So in that case, you save on petrol money, you save on logistic of traveling to the court, and you also make it to make sure that everyone is able to access those particular platforms in a much more efficient and much more a, a quicker way. So if you haven't introduced those things, of which all these ideas, by the way, they are for free. So you don't even need to, 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 to make sure that there are other and the staff that are going to be there, all that it needs is left for the department to then say, let us plan carefully as to what we are doing. Let us make sure that we're able to achieve the cases or the finalize the cases that we want to finalize within the quickest amount of time. Which is why when you were playing the insert in which the Chief Justice was stating the number of cases that have been finalized, the very first question that popped into my mind was, when were those cases first uh, instituted or maybe submitted to the courts? Mm -hmm. Now, if you are going to finalize 9,000 cases, however, the majority of them has been finalized over the past three or six years. It doesn't make the court efficient in that particular manner. Mm -hmm. The correct way of assessing the performance of the court should be how many cases do you get on an annual basis? How many of these cases were you able to finalize? What were the glitches which are there? Are there any costs which have been incurred by the litigants that are there? Which could have been ways that could have been employed so that they're able to, to, to be finalized within the quickest amount of time? If it involves criminal cases, and it is indeed the SAPS, and as, as the previous speaker was saying, in terms of them being properly uh, equipped and trained in terms of making sure that they do their jobs e efficiently, then get into those forums and be able to tell them that, in fact, you are losing all your cases because of the inefficiencies of the SAPS. Those are the type of questions that you should be asking, and those are the type of assessments we should be doing when we're assessing whether the Department of, of of constitutional development with the Department of Justice is doing the adequate, uh, the, the adequate job and they're able to deliver the services to the public of making sure that the provisions that you've, you promised in the Constitution are able to be met. The Constitution is clear. Justice is meant to be delayed within the shortest amount of time. And if you don't do that, in fact, you are breaking the Bill of Rights. Of course, I meant I was saying the court performance targets that uh, the Chief Justice um, was uh, referring to in the clips we played earlier. Uh, these are targets that the judiciary set, I mean, for, for itself. Uh, isn't that a bit of a problem in itself in that, I mean, we, we, we're judging them on the basis of what they themselves have, uh, you know, said is, should be the norm or the, uh, nor, should be norms or, or, or standards. Shouldn't that be a function of people outside, you know, of the judiciary itself? But then also extend it to parliamentarians in terms of saying they are there now on behalf as members of the public. So they should be going out there and be able to ask those questions and say, are the courts delivering the type of services that you require? Now, you'd find that most of the finalized cases are mostly concentrated in the high court divisions. What happens with the magistrate mm -hmm. courts? Those are the interfaces 
of, of, of justices. So a court should be able to function well at Tewene and Wagoma all the way up to Mzinyat if it needs to be. And there shouldn't be any hindrances which are going to take place because that's the only place, I think that's the manner in which you should understand it. Mm -hmm. This is the only place in which a member of the public is going to be able to interact with justice and be able to see and be able to hear justice being done. Now, if you don't make sure that all those forums, the nitty the procedures that need to be followed are ironed out, and also the, even the, the, the judiciary comes back to us and tells us that this is the way in, in which we are performing, and we question that, I think we're not going to get anywhere if we do not do all those processes. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, Joel, uh, one one is, I mean, from, from where you sit, um, are we getting enough of the oversight that the legislative arm um, is supposed to play? Are we getting enough or is there enough resourcing, uh, you know, of um, the, 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 the judiciary, uh, a function, of course, um, of um, the executive, which is the other arm uh, of the state as well? Uh, thank you. Um, I think even if we were to to get enough oversight, for example, the issue is whether there is enough resources. Because one, when one when listens to uh, Chief Justice, you could sympathize, sympathize with him in terms of how things have been done in the in the last uh, few years or so. The issue that one needs to, to deal with is whether there's enough resources for, 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 for judiciary to be able to implement um, or oversight in terms, of, I mean, in terms of implementing what they're supposed to do. Because oversight, yes, it could be an oversight and um, issues will be, no, this is wrong, this is right, but is, are those issues being addressed? And for me, I, I think if one looks at it, I do not think there is enough resources for the for the courts to be able to implement um, what they are supposed to to implement. So there could be shortcuts somewhere because something needs to be done, and that will have an impact in in the long run. Mm -hmm. So that's where the issue needs to to start. Enough resources for them. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go back then to some of the issues in Tabiseng um, that um, this. Senza Mayua case, I mean, so far that is, um, has has also has also raised. I mean, you saw Judge uh, Malisela there standing his ground, having none of the uh, accusations being leveled at him by Advocate Defu. Um, you also had um, uh, um, Mr. Defu accusing the police, accusing the NPA, accusing a president, uh, and so on. Just. What, what for you, uh, I mean, what, what do we, because remember, I'm, I mean, most of us, you know, don't, don't, don't really aren't, aren't affair with the, with the nitty gritty of, you know, court proceedings. And uh, television has, of course, brought um, the courts right into, uh, like in uh, our, li our living rooms. And uh, what we see, uh, you know, is, is, is what we then get to, you know, interpret in our own way without, of course, understanding, you know, how the law, the law works. And dramatic events like the one we saw in Crisella Lewis's uh, inset impact or influence the way we see um, uh, justice being meted out. Please unmute. My apologies about that. Okay. My apologies about that. I'm of the opinion that Ndatete was misguided in terms of how he dealt with criminal procedure. And over and above that, I don't think he had sufficient experience in terms of how criminal procedure happens in, in courts. Um, hence, he had the outburst that he had. Hence, he um, conducted himself in the manner that he did. Um, some of the things that were actually quite important that we raised, he raised, for example, the docket and everything that he raised at the time that he was supposed to be doing um, cross-examination, um, not him, when Advocate Mutololo was doing cross-examination, he then stood up and raised the issue of the second docket. That is great information, but 
you know, it was brought in at the wrong time. You need to know as a criminal defense attorney when it is that you need to use certain information in order to make your case stronger or make it make more sense to the presiding officer. That is just based on, you know, information, but the actual court procedure, I feel like he really had no knowledge on how it is actually done. That's why they were always at loggerheads with the presiding officer at all times, because you'd be reprimanded saying, no, detective, that's not how you do this. You're supposed to be following it in this manner and that manner. I think most of us, whenever we watched it, we would cringe a little bit because we were like, what are you doing? That is not the manner in which you're supposed to be address addressing a presiding officer, no matter how frustrated you get. Because we do get frustrated, unfortunately, because sometimes what I'm saying is not really being heard by the presiding officer. But there is a way in which to make the presiding officer understand where you're coming from. And even when you are going to recuse yourself as an attorney um, of record or make an application, rather, to be moved as a tenure of record. There is a process in which you do that application. You don't just now start accusing the presiding officer in the manner that the detective did. Mm -hmm. Now, these things that he did, unfortunately delayed the trial unjustifiably so, because they were really not necessary. Mm -hmm. These things could have been done in a different manner by maybe informing um, the, the, the uh, the, the judge that is heading the, the, the court there and inform if you're not happy in the manner in which this particular um, presiding officer is handling the matter and then that can be dealt with on the side but not within the court proceedings. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately based on that this matter could have been much further but it was delayed by these um, other tactics that were happening on the side. Now, whatever challenges Bumelelo that um, uh, Mr. Tefu may have had, um, you know, the what what we saw there, I mean, impacts in the way impacts the way the public sees the courts, even though it's no fault of the court that uh, he may be inexperienced, that he may lack tactics or there are better ways, as Ntabi Seng was saying, of raising the very same issues uh, that, that he raised. How then does the system, you know, uh, take these things into account so that the justice is indeed seen uh, I mean, people see that uh, justice is indeed, you know, being done. In other words, how, how, how do we avoid uh, having these things impacting uh, the way the public sees the court system? Now, now, it all falls upon the presiding officer. Let's remember, the presiding officer becomes the referee mm -hmm. and also the decision maker at the end of the process. But before you're a decision maker, you then become the referee and then take in all the different inputs which come from different stakeholders which are pulling you from one side to another. Now, there are rules and procedures that have to be followed. Let's take the Criminal Procedure Act, for example. It says under a certain section, I think it's section 342, Cable Channel A or 349. It says, this is how we're going to deal with unreasonable delays. So the number of questions which are going to be asked, if there's certain evidence that we need to bring in, there's a certain manner in which you make that particular application, your application must be typed, be given to all parties. They must have sufficient time if, in which to respond. You can't spring something up in, in the morning of those proceedings and expect they will just to have consulted and be able to get uh, all the proper instructions between them. And then there are also certain practices that we then engage in, in terms of saying, if I'm going to come within, within an application on Monday, which is going to impact on my fellow learned colleagues, let me alert them beforehand and say, this is what's going to happen. It might let the judge and tell them this, this is the manner in which those proceedings are going to be. So the rules are there and the rules need to be followed. And the job of the presiding officer is to then say, we are going to follow the rules and understand that we cannot deviate from these rules. But the most important question, or what we are looking for, or our aim is to make sure that members of the public at the end of the get their justice, the accused which are in the in the in the accused box also are given those particular rights and also let's think about the victims. So it's always coming back to the instances of saying that let me give you an opportunity to respond, let me give an opportunity to speak, of which I think the judge to a certain extent has been able to do that. There, I think there are only a handful of instances where one would have felt that if I was sitting in the chair, I would not have allowed those particular submissions to be made. But I think they've opened up that particular leeway. So if we do not have enough time to deal with those, to deal with those uh, applications, 
The only thing that you can do is to say, let me extend the court hours and give you a room to sit. Let's start at 9 instead of starting at 10. Let's end at 4 instead of ending at 3. Let's see if it includes other days so that we're able to accommodate each other as we are moving. Maybe as, as also the broader picture, I've always asked myself, any other institution which is important within government, if it opens on a Saturday, why don't our courts open on Saturday, maybe from 8 up until 3 or 8 up until 2, and simply deal with those in-house procedures that would have ended up wasting our court's time? If the well, individuals well, I, I remember there, that if, issue being raised when uh, uh, the Chief Justice released uh, that, uh, that report. And uh, I think his, his answer was something along the lines of, well, everything is possible as long as, uh, uh, I mean, you are going to, I mean, resource this. I mean, I remember even when um, he was talking about the state capture report, um, as to how we may have to proceed as everything is or should be on the table as long as there's a willingness um, on the part of all to actually come to the party. And if you decode that, uh, one of the big issues, of course, will be uh, making resources available for the people who will have to work on Saturdays or at night and, and all those things. But this conversation is uh, going to continue in a moment. And if you just joined us wondering what we're talking about, we're looking at some of the cases and instances that happened last year. Year, but which also shaped uh, public perceptions of uh, the administration of our justice system. Some of the cases, of course, are going to feature quite prominently in 2023. This conversation continues right after this. Welcome back. If uh, you've uh, just joined us, we're looking at some of the cases and instances of the past year that speak to how justice is being administered in our country. Some of the issues that people have raised about delays, but also um, we're looking at some of the performances uh, we've seen on our television screens um, as our reporters continue to bring us the cases that are happening uh, throughout our courts and what those are telling us about the performance of our judicial um, system and my guests for this conversation are Pomelelo Zigalala and Tabiseng Dubazana as well as Joel Mthongo. Joel, um, if I may come to you I mean, uh, this time around, you, know, um, you had uh, advocated for the uh, projecting himself as this victim uh, that people are calling uh, a problematic um, advocate. But we've also seen, for example, I mean, during um, the public protector um, cases, but also even the, the inquiry, the parliamentary inquiry into the public protector's fitness to hold offices. And people have raised issues about, you know, uh, the behavior um, of, of lawyers in the courts and in the inquiries um, and, 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 and so on. Is that an issue or becoming an issue I mean, for an organization like yours as well? Thank you. Yes, it is. I think what is important is that it is obvious that in certain instances, lawyers do play a role in terms of how quickly a case could, um, could, be, could be done. Because sometimes um, lawyers make um, unreasonable, countless applications that are not necessary. However, like one of... Um, um, our panelists has indicated previously, it's up to the judge to make sure that all those issues are nipped in the bud. Yes, there will be um, lawyers that uh, will be known for Stalin grant um, strategies, but however, that is not an issue that uh, we could uh, focus much on. All it could focus much on, the law provides what should happen when such kind of issues um, do happen. Yes, of course, Sometimes when you watch some of the lawyers, as someone that also comes from the legal background, you tend to um, be surprised on how things are done. Um, but however, that cannot be an issue that we could put much of a focus on. The focus should be on the referee to make sure that the rules of the game is played accordingly. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, how much of a problem, Pumelelo, is the is this phenomenon, um, the so-called St Stalingrad um, uh, tactics? In other words, how much of a burden are they really? Is 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 this posing and or, or adding? How much of a problem is it adding to the problems that the system already has of of, of delays, um, of cases not being finalised on time? That's always a difficult one because you must also remember that uh, legal practitioners are creatures of instructions. We are instructed by our clients. Mm. Now, our job is to come back and say to the client, these are the options that you have. These are the legal avenues that you still have. If you want to explore it, if you have the funds to fund for them, you can still be able to do it. Here are the chances of them being successful. If here are the chances of them failing, what do you want to do as, an, in, in, as, as a client that just came to me? So if you're going to carry on with, with a certain application, it is the, the instructions which have been then you've been given by your client, which is basically. So one is always very careful in, in, in terms of attaching the name Stalin Grant uh, tactics when it comes to legal proceedings, because then the question would be, if the particular legal avenue is available and is there, why am I not using it if it's available to me? Because at the end of the day, I'm of the firm belief that I'm defending my rights. I'm of the firm belief that I'm correct in what I'm saying. So I want the, this process to be carefully adjudicated. And I have the safe ground for the protection of the constitution that says, I must be able to get justice, justice at all costs. So if the provision is there, then it must be utilized. However, it is up to the presiding officer to then say, let us dispose of these particular applications as quickly as possible. Let's make sure that there's no time which is going to be wasted by people who are not going to submit their papers on time. And let's make sure that we're able to punish them where it hurts, which is usually on the fees and on the on, on, on the cost, and be able to adjudicate these matters as quickly as possible. So it, it is a stakeholder type of relationship that, need, that needs all the, the individuals that are there, all the players, to do their job and, and be able to offer this quick justice or the super justice that we're looking for. Are we, are we able, though, in terms of saying, I mean, or have the courts or been able, at least so far, to then... Yeah, you know, strike that balance that Bumele is talking about between, uh, I mean, uh, someone's rights to actually challenge, um, you know, what they regard to be unfair or wrong, but at the same time, uh, allowing the courts to, 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 to function as they should. I mean, the public protector, uh, suspended public protector, I should say, is one of those people who believe that she's been exercising her rights throughout um, the year, but people have been condemning her for, 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 for doing so, uh, accusing her of Stalingrad tactics. Well, I think it depends on who you appear in front of, the presiding officer, because um, we have different experiences in terms of the presiding officers we are in, uh, we are uh, appearing in front of. But like Mpumalelo said, when we deal with high court matters versus magistrate court matters, it's a completely different ball game. High court matters are more expeditious. Um, you know, we have more experience, not all the time, but more experienced presiding officers that are always there who will be able to guide and be proper referees in these, in these matters that we appear before them with. And then when you go to magistrate courts, it is, it is an utter disaster. And magistrates are unfortunately bound by the Magistrate, uh, Magistrates Act so they're creatures of statute, but they tend to make laws, uh, make the law unto themselves, and then they do things that unfortunately delay the process unnecessarily. That is when we're dealing with things like, it doesn't matter whether it's motion court, it's criminal court, it really doesn't matter. It becomes a fiasco for no apparent reason. And some magistrates actually do a very great job and that matters are, are dealt with very quickly. But unfortunately, it's not always the case. And having to balance the applicants or the, the, the litigants' rights versus um, getting the matters finalized as quickly as possible, it is such a difficult balancing act, I believe, for the presiding officer because you can't be seen to be prejudicing one litigant versus the other, you know, hindering them from exercising their rights in any other applications that are available to them in order for you to save time. Because now when I then, if I happen to lose in that particular matter, whether it is criminal or, or a civil matter, I will then cite this as part of uh, my review application is going to be by virtue of review or by appeal and say that the presiding officer was seen to have been biased throughout the proceedings. I was not permitted 
to voice out any other applications or any concerns that I may have had during the matter as it was being uh, handled or dealt with in that particular court. So striking this balance is kind of difficult. So when we deal with, when we look at rather the matters of Mim Kobani and what has happened in the past, she has had the privilege to be able to exercise all her rights that are available to her, all the avenues that are available to her. And as a result, because she knows which, which way to go, mainly because of her background in the, in the legal fraternity, and also having attorneys and advocates who are able to advise her correctly, I suppose, then she's able to now, you know, grab at the opportunities that are in front of her in order to help her case. But now, unfortunately, in the public eye, that is seen as if she's abusing her, her seat or she's abusing the legal system, whereas it's not the case. She has these avenues available to her. And like Mbumalela has said, we are creatures of, of instructions at the end of the day. And if the client wants to take this route and we feel like it's feasible, we will proceed in that route. Well, Joel, I mean, this, it's, it's interesting what uh, uh, Ntabi Singh um, is saying because, I mean, Western Cape Judge President uh, John Thorpe II has been accused um, uh, of, uh, of uh, these, uh, these Stalingrad, I mean, tactics. I mean, he was found guilty of gross misconduct um, by the Judicial Services Commission, I mean, dating back to 2008. Of course, we know now that, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, the president uh, suspended him um, late last year. I don't know whether that, that also, because I mean, it's not just about, I mean, president, former president Jacob Zuma is also one of those people who have been accused um, of this, but they do reserve their right to actually challenge uh, these decisions, don't they? Indeed, they do. Um, when we look at Judge Trump's case, it stems from 2008. And the JCT, I believe, Mpumalelo um, will correct me if I'm wrong, JCT was formed as a result of his particular case. Now, the, the intri interesting and intricate part of Judge Trump's case is that the misconduct that happened in 2008 some of the judges that were the of the eleven judges that were saying that he was trying that that and the desktop was trying to influence them in making a decision in the Bedozuma matter. Of those eleven, about eight did not want to proceed with that matter, and because they didn't want to proceed, the JCT was formed after the complaint was lodged. Right now, the issue is that the the JCT now wanted um, affidavits to be um, commissioned to or, or, or be made and commissioned this now forms as part of evidence and it's an oath that you're taking as a presiding officer that this and that happened on this and this a day and these were issues that the judges that were uh, complaining those judges were saying that I don't want to do this because this pro this matter when it started, it wasn't in such a formal manner. It was just an issue that I deposed to an affidavit. I'm supposed to now have it, um, have to go and give evidence at some stage, which now some of the judges were going against this issue. This is why it's taken so long because some of the commissions that were established to investigate the death of pay were uh, were established after the fact. And now the, the, they want that the, 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 the outcomes that are made in those commissions to apply retrospectively to a matter that was um, that started prior to the institute to the, to the commission having been inquired of. And this is the thing that Dr. Swape has been fighting and saying, I don't oppose that people are saying I, I attempted to influence them that is fine i will defend that but you can't now bring a commission of inquiry or uh, a certain uh, commission to investigate me for a matter that is now seven eight years old and now i'm supposed to be up, uh, upheld to the to the decisions that are made in this in this particular commission that is the part of the of this case that's going to make this very interesting as it goes further now at the end of the day uh, joel um, the credibility of, uh, of the courts do dep does depend um, on the public uh, perceptions, no matter how right um, the, the officers of the court may, may, think, may think they are. How do we then deal with this question of uh, you know, this Stalingrad tactics in ways uh, that ensure that courts are 
also seen to be because, because there's also the role of money like in these things because people who can't afford can't do this uh toing and froing so how, how do we any thoughts about how we can deal um with this question but also mindful of the of the of the inequalities that are in the system people can't access you know justice uh, often because they simply don't have money whereas people like judges and former presidents and public protectors and so on can do that Thank you. Uh, I think it's a, it's a very difficult question to answer in terms of uh, specifically saying this could be the answer to it. But however, what is important um, out of it is the fact that uh, lawyers have got a thought uh, in terms of what they're supposed to do and what they are not supposed to do. And what we have seen recently is the standard in which lawyers um, hold themselves uh, dropping to a level where the profession is no longer as respected as it used to be. And for me, the question that we need to ask ourselves, or what lawyers need to ask themselves, is the fact that are we doing justice to the profession? If the answer is yes, we are, then we can, then they or we can continue the way in which we are doing this. But if we feel that, no, we are not, or they are not, then they're supposed to look back what used to make them good. And yes, it's important the fact that um, one has to defend his client um, vigorously. But at the end of the day, the duty of a lawyer is, is um, to serve justice. And if that is the case, then we need to leave the politics aside and deal with what we are supposed to deal with. And the courts will be able to um, actually um, get the credibility that deserves because sometimes they are being um, um, dismissed by lawyers who are actually saying things that they know is wrong, but mm. because the public is not aware of mm. what is right and what is wrong. Quick one, 10 seconds, Mbumelelo. Have cost orders been able to deal with this question? Can you please repeat that? Can, have cost orders uh, been able to deal with this question? To, to a certain extent, yes, but they're not really that effective because if if someone would, would give a cost order against me for a million rands, I don't have that money to them. Mm. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to, to, to pay for that. And at, an, at the end of the day, the person who's litigating against me has, has, has been gone through a lot in terms of the cost in which they would have incurred. But the most important question for me is, if, if 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 it's not for me, then who who are those rules or those legal principles that have been created for? Mm. So if a law is there and okay. the rule is there and exploited at whatever point in time, mm. then we must be able to use it. At the end of the day, we, we are not there to adjudicate these matters. We are here to litigate on it. And okay. part of litigation is to all those processes. Okay. Thanks to all of you, Mpumelelo, Zigalala, and Tabiseng Tubazana, and of course, Joel Mshongo. Uh, from the Watchdog team, thanks very much for watching. To join us again tomorrow evening, same time.